Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. The Vetting The sleek alien shuttle crossed the Atlantic in minutes and silently decelerated from hypersonic speed to a full stop in seconds without the slightest hint of G-stress. Settling gently on the smooth black landing field, the door to the shuttle simply faded out of existence, and Marissa rose from her seat inside and exited the vehicle to marvel at her first glimpse of the Talesian Transportation Complex, an alien space terminal a mere hundred yards away. A dozen similar shuttles sat idle, parked across the large landing field. Marissa, however, stood motionless for a moment, awestruck at the tall, graceful buildings around her. Composing herself, she advanced toward the entrance and joined the flow of other arriving visitors into the transportation annex. Once inside, she found herself in a large room with a dome-like ceiling. Seemingly made from millions of crystals, it rose dozens of meters overhead. An alien female, the first she had ever seen in person, waited by the entrance and extended her hand toward Marissa. The attendant, a strangely beautiful hairless alien in a light blue smock, turned toward her and smiled. Marissa stared at her. She was taller than expected and thin, but lithe and graceful. The alien looked back at her, but said nothing. She simply smiled and waited, as if expecting Marissa to say or do something. Realizing what the alien attendant wanted, Marissa fumbled with her bag and pulled out a small metal ID card covered with unintelligible script. The alien scanned the card with a handheld device and said, Miss Hemming, please relax here in the waiting area. Your name will be called when it is your turn to be processed. Then the alien greeter turned, searching for another traveler to welcome. Marissa did not immediately move but continued to stare at the stranger. Yes? Asked the greeter. I... I've never met a Talesian before. I was just surprised at... Well, I was just struck with how beautiful you are. Marissa blushed at her own candor, but the female maintained her smile and said, Thank you. That is very kind. Sadly, Many of your species find the differences between us to be, well, too different. Many object to our presence here on your world and eschew us. Marissa knew this to be true. People seemed to either love or hate the aliens. Sometimes the dichotomy was quite stressful. Not knowing what to say, Marissa nodded politely and turned, advancing into the large reception hall, even though she barely had a clue what to expect. Most of the other people seemed to know where they were going. After a few moments, only a few people remained, who, like herself, seemed somewhat lost. Wandering slowly across the large departure terminal at the Talesian Interstellar Transportation Center, Marissa studied her surroundings. The holographic images and displays that lined the walls of the room showed amazing views of other worlds in the large galactic community from which the aliens had come. The Talesians were the only alien race humans had encountered. In truth, the extraterrestrials had only made themselves known after humans had established their first colony on Mars. They had simply appeared one day, barely introducing themselves, before they built the spaceport on a floating island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Measuring more than 10 miles across, it had been created in a single day and served as a transportation terminal between Earth's surface and the Talesian space station that hovered in orbit high overhead. It was the only place from which shuttles operated to carry people to the large interstellar transporter portals that the Talesians used to travel between the stars. What a waste, said a voice behind Marissa. Flinching in surprise, she turned to find a tall man behind her who was also surveying the exotic building. Excuse me? She said. Lowering his eyes from the ceiling overhead, he did not immediately reply, but rather examined her silently. After a moment, he introduced himself, saying, Paul Drake, CEO of Patronic Industries. I assume you're here as a candidate for the Talesian relocation program like the rest of us. 
the rest of us? She asked softly. Well, he said, turning and gesturing to another woman who stood nearby. Counting yourself, it looks like it's just the three of us. The other woman was Asian, perhaps ten years older than Marissa, and wore her hair in a tight bun. My name is Etsuko Mim, she said. I was the first to arrive, until Mr. Drake showed up. Do you think that more people will be coming, or is it just us? Marissa started to say she didn't know, but Paul answered instead. It will just be the three of us. The Talesians always do things in threes. But surely there will be more, said Marissa. No, he said again. I've studied the aliens extensively, and they only process three people at a time through their embarkation process. Like I said, what a waste. Marissa felt somewhat intimidated by Paul and glanced at Atsuko, who seemed to share her sentiments. These aliens are really something, he continued. They've got all this impressive technology, but they won't share any of it with us, like we're too stupid to understand or too inferior to be trusted. All they talk about is the grand galactic civilization that awaits us, and they offer us free travel to come visit their worlds, but they exercise absolute control about who they will allow to go. People are allowed to apply, but they hardly admit anyone. Uh, I know, stammered Marissa. I applied two years ago and took all those tests they required, but I never heard anything until a week ago when they sent me this card and told me I'd finally been accepted. Me too, echoed Atsuko. I thought I'd been rejected and had almost forgot about it. Paul Drake grumbled angrily. Did you know that since they opened this program, more than 20 million people have applied? But fewer than a thousand have actually been allowed to travel to the Talesian homeworlds? So few, asked Atsuko. I didn't realize that the number admitted was so low. I wonder why. It's true, he continued. The battery of tests they administer take more than four days to complete, and they screen out all but a very select group of people. <sighs> wow. I didn't realize that, said Marissa. You seem to know a lot about the aliens. I should. I've spent millions of dollars studying the Talesians and analyzing their screening tests. I've hired people to take their tests and had them wear hidden recording devices to learn what criteria they use to accept applicants. I decided years ago that I wanted to be accepted into this program, and when we decided which questions required what answers, I studied and finally took the exams myself. As you can see, I finally passed. Oh, mused Atsuko. I thought they were just intelligence and aptitude tests of some sort. They are, but they're much more too. The aliens apparently studied human beings for many years before they revealed themselves to us. The tests they've prepared evaluate many different aspects and traits of personality and individuality. Like I said, I've had my staff study these exams for years, and we still don't understand all the criteria they are looking for. In any case, we've learned enough to know what answers they find acceptable, so we can finally pass their tests. That's why I'm here. But didn't the acceptance letter mention something about one final test? Yes, replied Paul, and that's the only one I can't be sure of passing. Why is that? Well he said solemnly. Our staff thinks it is a physical test, one we can't finesse. We've gotten reports from others who got this far that it involves a whole body scan of some sort, one that you either pass or fail. Oh my, said Marissa. I wonder why that would be necessary. Paul nodded. My technical people think that it's some sort of compatibility test to see whether people can tolerate the energy field associated with the teleportation gates that they use to travel over interstellar distances. People who get this far are exposed to high energy fields that we think are associated with that technology, and those that are rejected are people who simply could not endure the process of teleportation. Then traveling is dangerous? asked Etsuko. Paul shrugged. We simply don't know. They make it sound safe, but if it is, then why do they need this final test? At that point, an attendant approached and informed them that it was time for final processing. The alien gestured to Atsuko and directed her to a counter for check-in. The Asian woman smiled softly at the two of them and turned to follow her guide. I guess they're going to take us in the order that we arrived, 
said Paul. Glancing around, he shook his head again. What an incredible waste, he said. This terminal could process thousands of people a week. Instead, fewer than a hundred people a week go through here to disembark to the stars. It's like the shuttles that brought us here. I was alone on my vehicle, but it was large enough that it could have accommodated 25 or 30 people. Have you any idea what they could charge for that kind of transportation service? I traveled from the west coast to this island here in the Atlantic in less than an hour. I know executives that would eagerly pay tens of thousands of dollars for that kind of transport. And the magnitude of the bureaucracy is staggering as well. Why would they take two years to process someone's applications? Marissa nodded silently before replying. I wondered about that too. I thought that it might be to see if people are really serious about participating in the program. If they make you wait so long, they find out whether you're really willing to leave Earth or if you just applied on a whim. After all, they say it will be a minimum of five or six years before we'll be able to return. That's why they only take people like me, who don't have any immediate family. She lowered her eyes as if ashamed. I told them I was divorced and had no children. Looking back up, she asked, Are you single? Paul nodded. That's right. No family. Never had time for one. Glancing at the counter where Atsuka was, Marissa said, I wonder about her. Do you think she's alone too? Yes, said Paul. I spoke to her before you arrived, and she told me she was widowed, and her only son died in a traffic accident some years ago. Gazing back at the woman, Marissa said, That's so sad. How awful that must be. Paul laughed softly. Don't feel bad. She's rich, and she said she's wanted to do nothing except travel since her husband died. This will be her greatest trip ever. His eyes narrowed and he asked, So, why do you want to leave everything behind and travel out to the stars? She shrugged. I have nothing to tie me down. My husband left me for another woman shortly after we married. I always wanted a family, but I've been alone since but I've always been curious and always wanted to travel to new places and see new things. Paul nodded gently and said, That's pretty typical of the answers that people give who are accepted. They don't want people who seek to travel just because they're bored. They seem to prefer those who want to explore. The Talesians screen out people who are too attached to things here. After all, a trip this long is quite a commitment. Glancing around, Marissa noted some nearby displays and noticed one nearby that featured a cage of small furry creatures. Oh, she said, what's that? Shaking his head, he replied, nothing important. Vermin from their home world. Just then, Atsuko left the counter and walked back to the two of them. They say that three of us have to be processed together. Looking up at Paul, who was half a head taller than her, she said, it's your turn. Shrugging the shoulder strap of his carry-on bag, Paul hurried toward the representative behind the counter without saying a word to either of them. Marissa turned back toward the display that had attracted her attention a moment before. Atsuko followed, suddenly curious as well. The display case was perhaps six feet across and consisted of a boxed-in area surrounded by low glass walls and filled with a small layer of sand. Scampering around the containment were a dozen small creatures with soft yellow fur and large dark eyes. Each was only three or four inches across, and they hurried over to the visitors as if equally curious about the humans. The creatures were roughly spherical and hurried about on tiny feet that were virtually invisible under their fur. Looking around, she noted a small sign to the left of the display. Weebles, small creatures indigenous to the world Caraval. These gentle herbivores are remarkably long-lived and are popular as pets across several star systems. Feel free to touch them. They can be obtained at your destination. Just notify any attendant and one will be reserved for you. Marissa carefully reached into the enclosure and extended her hand. Several of the creatures immediately approached her hand and sniffed it carefully. Then one jumped up into her hand Looking up at her, it blinked and began purring loudly. Marissa was unable to resist petting it. When she did so, the creature closed its eyes, 
and purred even louder. Oh my, she said. These are adorable. Asuka wrinkled her nose and said, You should probably be careful. Paul said that they were probably the equivalent of mice or rats, and that they could carry alien diseases. Marissa smiled and shook her head, ignoring her companion. It was obvious to her why the tiny creatures were valued as pets. Within seconds, she felt quite bonded to the one she held, and as she tried to set it down, two others tried to jump into her hand. It took all of her willpower not to pick one up and put it in her coat pocket. Noting the nearby placard, she resolved to reserve one at her destination. Losing track of time, she watched the creatures play until she was interrupted by Paul, who informed her that it was her turn. Taking her handbag that contained all the possessions she was allowed to take on her journey, she hurried to the counter. The check-in process took nearly five minutes, and as Paul had foretold, everything seemed to be part of an elaborate bureaucratic process. They verified her identity a half a dozen ways, including a long series of questions as well as several biometric tests, and what she presumed were DNA tests. When Marissa asked questions, the attendant merely smiled and ignored her queries. The only response she received was that all her questions would be answered in due time. When she was done, she simply said, Please tell your companions to journey together to the end of the hallway. Your final test is there. When she told Paul and Atsuko that they were ready to proceed, Paul grumbled and muttered, Finally! Together, the three approached a portal that led to a long hallway. At the entryway, there was another display. This one hosted several containers of small items. A nearby sign said, These are provided as mementos for your trip. Please take only one. Paul was impatient to proceed, but Marissa was drawn to the table and stopped to look at the items. A series of eight bowls were arranged on the table, each slightly more than a foot across. Each bowl held small items. One contained small silver disks that, when touched, projected a holographic image of the Earth. A tiny bright point of light, presumably the space station overhead, rotated around the globe of blue, white, and green. A second bowl held tiny golden beads that, when squeezed, expanded to a delicate lattice of incredibly detailed design, which slowly contracted back to tiny metallic spheres. The third one immediately drew Paul's attention. It contained small crystal spheres that were engraved with the features of the planet Ashtara, the Talesian homeworld. My God, said Paul. Have you any idea what these are? Both Marissa and Atsuko shook their heads. Bobbles? suggested Marissa. No, not at all. I've seen one of these before. They were given to several world leaders at the one and only time the Talesians visited the UN. Picking one up delicately, he examined it closely. This is not an engraved crystal. This is an engraving on a diamond. A single flawless diamond. The one I saw was identical to this and measured just less than 45 carats. The Prime Minister of England sold his and devoted the proceeds to charity. It sold for more than 30 million pounds. Holding it in front of him, he added, just a single one of these would make you a millionaire many times over. Hurriedly, Paul reached into the bowl and took a handful of the tiny globes and stuffed them into his suit coat pocket. Then he paused before unzipping the single piece of carry-on luggage and took a second handful of the small globes before turning and hurrying toward the portal. Atsuko took one, and then, after looking around, she took two more. Marissa looked at the bowls and reached to take one of the priceless diamonds, but stopped. Then, she decided that the hologram was prettier and took only a single silver disc. Then she too hurried through the portal. The entryway opened to a long, dark corridor that looked like the inside of a shiny silver tube. The only light emanated from a brightly lit platform at the other end of the tunnel, where several attendants stood waiting. As they started down the corridor, one of the people there left the others and walked toward them. He walked slowly and was bent over, as if he were very old. They continued toward the platform, and the elderly alien stepped to one side to let them by. 
As they passed him, going the other way, he nodded and smiled, and then suddenly stumbled and fell. Marissa gasped and hurried to the man's side. Are you all right? She asked. Paul paused and looked back, annoyed. I'm fine, said the old man, but she could see that he was obviously in pain. Come on, said Paul. We've wasted enough time. He said he's okay. Then he pointed and said, Look, there are others coming who can take care of him. Glancing up, Marissa saw two people hurrying from the entryway behind them, hurrying to see what the commotion was. Marissa, however, refused to leave the old man's side. Have it your way then, said Paul as he turned to continue down the corridor. You really don't want to be late. Atsuko paused and hesitated. She seemed torn as to whether to follow Paul or to stay with Marissa. Glancing back and forth, she took a short step to follow Paul, then another. Finally, she turned her back and walked away. Marissa stayed with the man until the approaching attendants reached her. She held his hand and he smiled appreciatively at her as she did so. Those who arrived helped the old man to his feet and they reassured Marissa that he would be all right and would be attended to. Picking up her handbag, Marissa hurried to catch up to her companions. As she reached the platform, she saw Paul standing on the raised dais, which glowed brightly. His arms were extended out from his sides and his eyes were clenched shut as he was drenched in some sort of intense energy. After a moment, he started to glow and then the light display abruptly shut off. He lowered his arms and an attendant examining on an electronic clipboard of some kind approached and shook her head. I'm sorry, Mr. Drake. You have not passed the final test. I'm afraid you will have to return. Drake protested and demanded that they perform the test again. As the attendants refused, Drake became louder and started cursing. Within moments, two other larger representatives appeared and forcibly escorted Paul Drake through a door to the side of the test chamber. After he was gone, an awkward silence shrouded the room. The assistant conducting the tests gestured for Atsuko to move to the platform. Hesitant and afraid, she slowly complied. When the technician touched a button on her electronic clipboard, the platform lit up once again, and one could see and feel the energies that gradually build up around Atsuko. The bright lights and loud humming of the hidden machinery reached a crescendo and then slowly faded. The test administrator examined the information on her tablet once more and raised her eyes to Atsuko, only to slowly shake her head. The Asian woman burst into tears and had to be assisted off the platform and through the exit to the side of the chamber. A tightness formed in Marissa's chest as she felt a pang of pity for the woman. Neither spoke, but Marissa almost succumbed to tears as well. Gathering herself, Marissa took a step to mount the dais and repeat the test that Paul and Atsuko had endured. The technician, however, touched Marissa's arm and said, Oh, that won't be necessary, Miss Hemming. You can follow me and embark immediately. Marissa stood, confused. She pointed at the electronics in the platform and started, But... The technician interrupted her with a mere smile and explained, Oh, that. We don't need to power that up again. You've already passed the final test. Uh, but how? She asked. That thing, said the attendant, doesn't really do anything. It's merely a fancy pyrotechnic display that gives those who fail the last test something to anchor on. Otherwise, they wouldn't really be able to accept that they failed. You mean that isn't the test? That's correct. The final test started the moment you got off the shuttle. The alien guide sighed and paused. Let me see, how should I explain this? It's different for everyone who comes through here. You see, here on Earth, as well as everywhere in the galaxy, there are two kinds of people. Those who give and those who take. Those who compete and those who collaborate and cooperate. When a species is young, 
Competition is important, critical. In order to survive, a species has to overcome competition by others who compete for essential resources. However, when a race matures and societies develop, cooperation becomes a more dominant strategy, and those individuals that collaborate and work together survive better than strong individuals. In highly advanced civilizations, the drive for dominance and supremacy becomes disruptive and counterproductive. Indeed, in our culture, those who demonstrate such traits are considered deviant and, well, socially deficient. Such individuals would not fit into our society, and others would find their behavior shocking and insulting. Much of the testing that we administer seeks to attempt to measure such things, but the nature of psychometrics means that some things are difficult or impossible to measure indirectly. That is why we administer the final test here. You see, the final test is not one of intelligence or aptitude. Rather, it is a test of empathy. Gesturing at the exit door through which Paul and Itsuko had passed, the alien added, You passed the tests that they failed. But, I mean, what was the test? The test was heuristic. It was behavioral and based upon how you acted and reacted. Since arriving, there have been many opportunities for you to show your true self. You see, it consisted of many things. The way you interacted with the greeter who first met you. The way you responded to the weebles in the display outside. You were watched the entire time. We know that you did not steal or plunder the valuable keepsake gifts in the reception area, and most telling of all was your reaction to the man who fell in the hallway. You demonstrated empathy and integrity instinctively at every point of your journey here. You mean, that man fell on purpose? Asked Marissa. Yes, she replied, nodding knowingly. That is one of his primary roles here. He meets newcomers every day and falls to the ground every time. He's gotten quite good at it. Marissa's face reddened. You see, you can cheat on tests and there are other things you can fake for a time, but sometimes one's true nature reveals itself in unexpected ways and at unexpected times. Marissa thought on that for a moment and felt a little pride in herself. Then she frowned. Wait, so how is it that no one knows about this final test? I mean, you just told me. Don't other people know too? Yes, others know, but we ask them not to tell others about it. Those left behind wouldn't understand, wouldn't agree, or wouldn't accept. So, we just don't mention it to them. The technician took her arm and pulled her away from the simulated test platform. Trust me, she said, there's much more that you'll need to learn and there are others who will have all the explanations you need. Come with me. It's almost time to leave, and there are others I'm certain you'll want to meet. It's a new season, and we have some new authors and new storylines that will absolutely delight you. And as you know, we absolutely love our listeners, fans, and patrons. If you loved what you heard, consider joining us over on Patreon. That's where all the fun happens. Just visit www.patreon.com forward slash Melissa Del Toro voiceover. If you'd like to read more of the stories in the Untold Tales series, not narrated here on our podcast, you can find Jeff's books on amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. The links for all of this information are conveniently listed in this episode's show notes. Thank you and have a wonderful day.